Hey Tigers, this is your digital reteach for Texas Essential Knowledge and Skill 8.5c. Interpret the arrangement of the periodic table, including groups and periods to explain how properties are used to classify elements. It's important that you understand how to get credit for this digital reteach. Use the Cornell Note worksheet from your teacher while you watch this video. Take notes, answer the questions, and be sure to write your summary when you finish. Then, show your completed Cornell Notes worksheet to your teacher. They will give you information about the next retest. Now, it's also important to note that in this video, if you need more time to work, please make sure you go ahead and pause the video. Take your time. The beauty of this is you can watch it as many times as you need to, you can pause it, you can go back, and that can help you understand the concepts much, much better. Let's begin. The first section of your Cornell notes is labeled as required prior knowledge. These are just things that you kind of have to know or at least have a good feeling for to kind of get where we're going to be going to for the eighth grade content. So if you think back to sixth grade, in sixth grade you broke up the periodic table into three different categories. You had your nonmetals, your metals, and your metalloids. And we basically said that the metals were most of the periodic table and were found on the left hand side. We then said that the nonmetals were on the right hand side, and you had the metalloids that were along that stair step line. In sixth grade, what we really wanted you to get out of that was that there's physical properties for these elements. There's things you can observe about them. And for metals, we usually see that they have luster, so they're usually shiny. They're usually conductive, so heat and electricity can pass through them. And they're usually malleable which means we can kind of hammer them into different shapes and it still holds their current properties. For the nonmetals, those physical properties were pretty much the opposite. They tend to not have luster, so they're not shiny. They're also not conductive usually, so gas and electricity has a hard time passing through them. And they're usually not malleable. So if we hammer them and try to get them into a new shape, they're usually brittle and they break. Then you had the metalloids that kind of had a little bit of both. So for the physical properties, when you look at it, you'll see some properties that were a metal, and you'll see other properties that were a non-metal. And that's your indicator that you're looking at a metalloid. Now in eighth grade, some of the required prior knowledge that you have was all about the structure of the atom. Things you needed to know were that protons, neutrons, and electrons are your three subatomic particles. You really do need to know the mass of each one of those. It's going to help you out a lot in a little bit. So for protons, we remember that each proton has the mass of 1. Each neutron has a mass of 1. And then we went on to say the electrons, they're just too small. And for middle school, we don't even need to count them. And then we had the electrical charge. We remember that protons are positive. Neutrons are neutral and do not have an electrical charge. And the electrons were negative. And then finally, you need the location of each one. We had the electrons that are out in the electron clouds. I'll call those energy levels quite a lot in this video. And then you had your protons and your neutrons and their location is inside the nucleus. We also added valence electrons. This was a new term for us this year. So for valence electrons, whatever the outermost ring for that atom is, those are the valence electrons on that ring. So in this one, we're looking at aluminum. And here we can see it has one, two, three valence electrons. These will become incredibly important when you get to high school. For now, what we just need to understand is they're going to determine the chemical properties. And most importantly for us, that is going to be things like reactivity, how well this atom interacts with other atoms, whether that'll stick together or whether it'll cause some sort of a reaction like sparks and fizzes and explosions. All right, now if we go to the next section of your Cornell notes, we've got our current stuff, the arrangement of the periodic table of elements. This is the one that we're focusing on really heavily right now. So when we get to this, we gotta remember a couple important things about information on the periodic table. The first thing is this atomic number. So in this case, the atomic number is 14 for silicon. And all the atomic number really means are how many protons are in one atom of that element. Next up, we've got the atomic mass. Basically, how much mass is one atom of that element? Now, we're going to go ahead and round that number. We don't need the decimal point. So this one's just going to round to 28. And if we think back to the last slide, anything that has mass is quite simply just the protons and the neutrons. We already said the electrons are too small. We're not going to worry about them. 
So if we add up all the protons and we add up all the neutrons in one atom of silicon, we would get 28. And that's exactly what we see here. Since the atomic mass is 28, we already know 14 of the things inside the nucleus are protons. So we just take that whole 28, subtract the 14 things that we already know are protons, and that leaves us with 14. So we know there's 14 neutrons. Your teacher might have used the simple help reminder of ape man. And if the simple reminder of ape man helps you out, use that right here. It's perfect. Okay, now looking at the actual periodic table itself. Sixth grade was okay. You got to see that it was broken into three categories, metals, nonmetals, and metalloids. But in eighth grade, now we got to understand that every single element has a place and it has to be there for a certain reason. So the first thing we're going to look at is let's just look at one group here. So if we look at group 3A, in this group, what we notice is if we were to draw a Bohr model of each one of these elements and get one atom for each one, we would start to see something they all have in common. So if you look at this picture, that 3A is incredibly important. And then each and every one of these Bohr models has three of something. And when you can figure that out, that's when you understand why elements are in the same group. So here it is for you, group 3A. If you look at every single one of these Bohr models, you're going to notice they all have three valence electrons. One, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, and three. Now this is incredibly handy for us because in middle school, we only know how to draw Bohr models for the first three rows. Once we get down to these bigger ones, we don't really have the tools and the rules required for that. It's also nice because now I don't have to wait forever to draw the whole entire thing. If I get asked how many valence electrons an element has, I just have to look at the group number. Now the other thing we have to remember is those valence electrons are going to determine the chemical property of reactivity. So it's safe to say that any element that is in the same group or family will react in a similar fashion. So I know these elements are most like one another. Nobody else near them is quite like them. That's why they're in the same family. Okay, let's look at another example for how these groups work. Let's go ahead and take group 8A. It's on the far right hand side. Now as we look at these, what, let's just say we had a question on a test. How many valence electrons are there in an atom of krypton? Now the first challenge we have is that's too far down the periodic table. So we cannot draw a Bohr model with the rules from 8th grade. Now maybe we'd get lucky and they would give us a picture. In that case, we can just go ahead and count the valence electrons. But most of the time, they won't give you that picture of that Bohr model. So for that, we've got to remember that krypton is in group 8A, so it simply has 8 valence electrons. If you know the group number, you know how many valence electrons it has. And this picture here will confirm that. we got 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, and 8. So make sure you guys have those all counted up, and you check any one of them, everybody in this family has eight valence electrons. Now helium is a little bit different in this family. He only has two, but if you remember, the first energy level can only hold two valence electrons anyway. So he still belongs in this family. His energy level is full, and everybody else has eight valence electrons on their last ring, which is the most valence electrons you can ever have anyway. And so helium still belongs in this family. Moving on, if we think about these rules, you'll notice that we only did this for group 1A, 2A, 3A, 4A, 5A, 6A, 7A, and 8A. This rule does not work for the middle section of the periodic table. That's the transition metals. When you get to high school, they'll work with you on that. For now, just understand that we will not ask you about valence electrons for that middle group. Now, as you'll recall, the periodic table is also broken into periods. Period 1, period 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, and 7. Just like the group numbers, those periods are there for more than a simple grid. Let's look at period 2 and see what all those elements have in common. So just by looking at the names and the symbols, nothing really sticks out to me. 
There's some metals in there. There's some non-metals in there. It's really kind of a mixture. But that's only if you look at it in the sixth grade world. In eighth grade, if we look at the Bohr models, you'll notice period two, every one of these atoms has two of something. And if you found it, that something is the energy levels. Each one of these Bohr models would take two energy levels to complete. So I know that anything in period two is going to have two electron clouds. So what's nice about that is that way if I get any element in period one, these all have one energy level. Period two has two energy levels. Anything in period three is going to have three energy levels. And this continues even below this. Even though we don't draw these below there, the rules would still be the same for this. So any element that's in period four would also have four energy levels. Anything in period five, five energy levels. Period six, six energy levels. And then the highest we can go right now is seven at seven energy levels. So that's kind of nice. So if you get asked any element on the entire periodic table and you get asked how many electron rings there are or energy levels there are, all you have to do is look at the period number and you have your answer. No need to draw the Bohr model. All right, next part of your notes is on the back. So flip your notes over and there's a section called putting it all together. This is gonna be sample questions for you to use your periodic table and see how well you understand the arrangement. So it's very important to make sure you do have a periodic table to look at when answering these questions. All right, so question one, and you do not need to write the question, just go ahead and write your answer. Question one is how many energy rings does an atom of indium have? And to help you find indium, the symbol is IN. Pause if you need more time. The second question is how many valence electrons does an atom of iodine have? To help you find iodine, the symbol is I. For the third question, which element would we expect to have the most similar properties to bromine? Would it be selenium or would it be iodine? Question four, what does the period number on the periodic table of elements tell us? And question five, what does the group number on the periodic table tell us? Pause the video now if you need some more time and then we'll go over some basic answers. All right, for question one, indium would have five energy levels. For question two, iodine would have seven valence electrons. For number three, iodine would have the most similar properties to bromine. Now your answer to number four can be a lot of different answers, but somewhere in number four, you have to mention that the period number is gonna tell you the number of energy levels. Same thing in number five, you can have a lot of different answers, but somewhere in your answer, you need to make sure that you've got it listed that the group number tells you the number of valence electrons. Okay, so that's it for your notes section. Your final section is the summary. So during your summary, you're gonna explain the different ways the periodic table is arranged in your own words. Be sure to use complete sentences and write a short paragraph summarizing all your notes from this video. If you're having a hard time doing this, just go back and watch some more of the video and grab a couple extra notes. When you're done with that, you've completed the digital reteach. So go ahead and show this worksheet to your teacher and they'll let you know how the retest is gonna work.